Hi everyone and welcome to today's Kitchen Sessions live lecture, which today is called Sitting, Physical Activity and Health and that's presented by Dr Lizzie Deary, who's a lecturer, lecturer in exercise physiology here at the University of Chester. So I'm going to hand over to Lizzie in just a moment. I'm here, my name's Anna and I'm here with my colleague Gav who's working behind the scenes to hopefully sort out some of your questions as they come in and then we'll pose those to Lizzie at the end. First of all, just um, a bit about how it works. So just to reassure everyone watching that you, your video and audio won't be visible during the lecture today. Um, if you want to engage with the, the session, then you're very welcome to ask questions as we go along using the chat function on the right hand side of your screen. Um, if you want to become, if you want your name to be anonymised, um, that's fine. You just need to tick the box um, to select that. Um, you can also like other people's questions, so give them a thumbs up if it's something that you want to find out too, and then we'll ask Lizzie the most popular questions at the end. Um, we'll allow about Lizzie that talked about 20 minutes and then we'll put all the questions to Lizzie at the end and, and see how we get on. So I'll hand over to Lizzie now. Um, and here's her talk. Brilliant. Thank you very much for the introduction, Anna, and thank you everybody for tuning in today. Um, so as Anna has said, I am Dr Lizzie Deary and I'm a lecturer in clinical exercise physiology here at the University of Chester and I'm based within the Department of Clinical Sciences and Nutrition. So for the next 20 minutes or so, I will be talking to you about sitting time, physical activity and health. If you do have any questions that aren't addressed um, during the session or at the end, perhaps you think of them afterwards, please do feel free um, to email me. I'm more than happy to take questions after the session as well. So a bit of an outline as to what we will be going over this afternoon. So first of all, we're going to take a brief walk through the history of Movement for Health. And I say a brief walk through because in reality, if you were to study this at university, either at undergraduate or postgraduate level, then this history of the evidence for um, exercise for health would actually be covered in an entire module. So you would have multiple lectures on this. But I'm going to do my best to whistle stop tours through it this afternoon. We'll then take a look at the occupational sitting time evidence. What do we know about how much we're sitting at work and the impact that that could be having on our health? And then I'm going to finish by speaking about how we can all move more at home. And this is obviously particularly important because um, for the last nine months, a lot of us have been working and studying from home um, and that could be having a knock on impact on our health as well. So the idea that movement is good for us is not a novel one. So um, I'm sure this statement is one that you've heard of before. Walking is man's best medicine. And this was coined by Hippocrates. So all of these um, variables that you can see on the screen are some of the things that you can expect to benefit from if you engage in regular physical activity. So you can expect to have an improved bone mineral density, to have a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, to have a lower risk of high blood pressure, of obesity, of type 2 diabetes, and also have improved um, mental and social well-being as well. So exercise really is the magic pill, if you like, that can impact on a whole host of health risks that we see in today's society. But how do we know this? Um, well, we can't go as far back as Hippocrates to um, see some um, robust evidence on this. But we do go all the way back to the 1950s. Um, so the gentleman that you can see on the top left hand side of your screens now is Jeremy Morris and he was um, a physician epidemiologist who really began um, the evidence for movement for health. So he conducted a study called the London Bus Study, which if you've studied this type of thing before, you may be familiar with, um, but the chances are this is a, a completely new concept to all of us. And what Jerry Morris found within this study was that London bus drivers who were more sedentary than the bus conductors had double the incidence of cardiovascular disease risk and death when they were compared to the conductors. And bear in mind that this was 1950s, not 2020, so there were no oyster cards. These conductors were running up and down the stairs on the buses, jumping on and off the different buses um, and getting lots of physical activity into their day. Um, it's worth noting that Jerry Morris lived till he was 99 years old, so anything that he has to say about physical activity and health, we probably 
all want to listen. But we won't just take his word for it. This was then supported with further evidence into the 60s and 70s, when very similar findings were shown in railway and longshore workers as well. So those who had sedentary jobs were at a much higher risk of cardiovascular disease when compared to those who were in active jobs. And this couldn't be explained by differences in waist circumference either. So this at this point was very much to do with occupational movement. As we moved towards the 80s, it became a lot more about leisure time energy expenditure. Um, so essentially the calories that we burn in our leisure time outside of work. So the Harvard alumni study was carried out on Harvard alumni, as the name might suggest. And what they did was sent questionnaires um, to the alumni and um, tried to ascertain their physical activity levels um, and correlate this with health risk. And what they found was that to gain health benefits, individuals were exercising to expend two to three thousand calories a week. So for anybody who does any walking, jogging, running, you'll understand that equates to about 20 to 30 miles a week. So it's a substantial amount. As we move closer to the 90s, um, we were able to quantify the level of fitness needed to produce some health benefits or protective effects. Um, and Stephen Blair in the Aerobic Centre Longitudinal Study carried out uh, maximal tests on a very large number of people and found that those who had um, what we call a MET max of more than 10 METs had the lowest risk of cardiovascular disease and death. Um, again, for anybody who's not familiar with um, the terminology around this, put that into some context. To have um, a maximum capacity of 10 METs, you're looking at running a 10K in under an hour. Um, so again, it's uh, a relatively high level of fitness. As we move then towards the 90s, it moved away from fitness and onto the first guidance for how physically active we should actually be. And it was recommended that we should accumulate 30 minutes of exercise a day. Um, and of course, we still have physical activity guidelines today, which some of you may be familiar with. If you're not familiar with them, then the chief medical officers recommend that we achieve either 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise a week or 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise a week or indeed a combination of both of these things. It used to be said that we should accumulate this in at least 10 minute bouts, but the World Health Organization just this year have um, done away with that idea and said that actually any amount is good. So if you can walk for two minutes, um, then that's better than not doing anything at all. If you can walk for 10 minutes, great. If you can walk for 30 minutes, brilliant. So essentially we're looking at 30 minutes a day, five days a week to meet the government guidelines. So Sport England published data on how many of us actually do achieve the guidelines. And what they find is that the number of people achieving 150 minutes a week is about 63% of the population. So whilst it is a majority, it still leaves a very large proportion of the population who aren't achieving the guidelines and are therefore putting themselves at an increased risk um, of health ailments. You'll note the asterisks next to the 63% here, and this is because Public England have also published data looking between March and May of this year. Of course, that was when the first lockdown was introduced. And what they found was that perhaps surprisingly, physical activity levels actually dropped by 7%. So although we had more time to be physically active, um, as a whole, our population levels fell. And there's a number of reasons that that might be, and I'm happy to talk about that at the end if anyone is interested in it. So a few more definitions before we get in to the juicy stuff. So we've spoken a lot about physical activity and exercise. It's important to highlight at this point that they are actually two separate um, definitions. So physical activity is any um, movement of the body which expends energy. So as we pace around our kitchens, as we walk up and down the stairs, as we carry our shopping in from the car, then we're accumulating physical activity. But exercise is physical activity which is structured, planned and repetitive with the purpose of conditioning. So, for example, if I go out for a run, if I go for a swim, if I go to the gym, if I go to my Zumba class, then that is exercise. 
We then have a term called physical inactivity. And this is the term given to somebody who doesn't achieve those 150 minutes that is recommended by the government. And it's said that physical inactivity is responsible for six to 10% of what we call non-communicable diseases. So these are essentially lifestyle related con conditions like type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, certain types of cancer. And physical inactivity is also responsible for 5 million deaths around the globe every year. So physical inactivity really is a public health priority that um, the, the, the World Health Organization is working um, to essentially eradicate. Separate to all of these things, however, is sedentary behaviour. So sedentary behaviour is any activity during waking hours when we expend less than 1.5 mets. So mets are a metabolic equivalent task. We don't need to worry about that. All you need to remember is that, phys or, sorry, is that sedentary behaviour is when we are sitting, lying or reclining, but we, we don't include sleep in that. We do let you have your sleep. That's very important to help. The most important thing of all of this is that sedentary behaviour is separate to physical inactivity. So you could be somebody who achieves the 150 minutes of physical activity every week, but still spend most of your time sat down. And that has become known as the active couch potato phenomenon. So it's thought that individuals spend around 12 hours every day sitting and I know that you're thinking that is a lot. I definitely don't achieve that. So let's break it down. Let's have a look. So if you have about an hour's commute to work, give or take, you then spend eight hours at work or at school sat down and then you have your hours commute home. It's possible that once you get through that 10 hour period, you then have a couple of hours of screen time in the evening, be that catching up on um, your favourite show on Netflix, be it your internet banking, uh, catching up on emails, Christmas shopping perhaps at this point. Um, and there we very quickly have 12 hours per day of sitting. Now, it may be that you've lost that two hour commute in your day, um, but think critically about how you are then spending those extra two hours. Are you moving around? or are you sat down? However you look at your sitting time outside of work, we know that 70 to 80% of the working day is spent sedentary for most of us. And that is very important. Firstly, it's important because we know that almost 90% of workers perceive health and sitting time to be related. So straight away, this should be a priority for employers in terms of promoting employee well-being. But we also know that it's more than just a feeling. This isn't just something that people imagine or perceive. The, um, the association data actually agrees. So I'm going to walk you through now um, a much more brief history of sedentary behaviour and health. So when we looked at exercise and health, we went all the way back to the 1950s. Now we're just going back to 2008. So this is a very new area of study, really. So some of the early evidence was coming out of Australia and what these researchers were finding was that sedentary time, waist circumference and metabolic risk were all associated and the really important message um, that really made this a bit of a game changer in the field was that it was independent of moderate to vigorous physical activity. So even amongst people who achieve the physical activity guidelines, there was still this independent risk with high sitting time. This was then replicated in 2009, when researchers reported a higher risk of mortality across higher levels of sitting time. And then again in 2015, an association was shown with metabolic syndrome, which is a clustering of conditions such as obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Now in 2016, there was a little bit of a curveball within the literature, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on, but researchers found that there was a protective um, effect of achieving more than 35 met hours per week when comparing those who sat for less than four hours and more than eight hours. And I'll delve into that in a, um, a few slides time. But regardless of this, it did seem that there was a strong relationship between the amount of time we spend sitting and cardiometabolic health. So then the next important question becomes why? What are the physiological responses to sitting that seem to be causing these health impacts? 
So there was a nice review published in 2017 by researchers at John Moores University in Liverpool, and they produced this infographic, which brings together really nicely some of the responses. But we'll delve into the literature a little bit more. So three hours of prolonged sitting, which is potentially what you're coming up to now if you had a quick lunch break at midday and then sat back down at one o'clock and are now looking at your watch wondering where the time's gone. So three hours of prolonged sitting decreases femoral artery function. Um, it, again, you don't need to know necessarily what that terminology means. What you need to know is that it tells us about how well your artery can dilate and that tells us about the health of your artery. So artery function is linked very closely to cardiovascular disease risk. If we look at one day of prolonged sitting, then we know that there is a negative impact on insulin action and insulin we know to be related to the risk of type 2 diabetes. And then finally, if we look over a longer period at two weeks of total physical inactivity, we can see a lower insulin sensitivity, a decreased lean leg mass and a decreased VO2 max. And again, all of these things known to be linked to metabolic health. Now, as a bit of a caveat with this final research, I used to always say to my students when I presented this, you can see it's published in 2010. So I've been presenting on this particular paper for about five years now. Um, and I always say to students, be critical of that. Less than 1,500 steps per day is very low. And then the pandemic hit and suddenly 1,500 steps a day felt like a bit of a challenge, didn't it? How many times did you have to walk around the block to get that? Um, so actually, this could be quite reflective of what we're now seeing in a lot of our population. So if prolonged sitting is the problem, then what is the impact of interrupting sitting? And we've got some evidence on this. A lot of the evidence is taken from lab based studies, but some evidence is taken from real life office studies as well. And what the evidence suggests is that if we in interrupt sitting with standing or light walking, then we can increase blood flow, we can decrease blood pressure, we can improve blood markers such as glucose and insulin, and we know these things are related to type 2 diabetes. And we also see improved mood states, improved productivity and improved musculoskeletal comfort as well. So there are profound benefits to breaking up sitting. Now, in 2007, the World Health Organization said that all workers should be able to enjoy the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health and favorable working conditions. So looking at all of the data that we've already looked at in terms of statistics of how sedentary we are and the impact that that's having, I think it could be argued that we are falling short of this at the moment. In 2015, there was a publication um, and what the uh, lead author on this is Prof Professor John Buckley, who is um, one of our very own members of staff based at the University Centre Shrewsbury. And what this publication said was that office workers should spend two to four days, two to four hours every day, not two to four days, two to four hours every day breaking up their sitting. This really created an influx in um, the research into the ways in which we can reduce workplace sitting. So um, these three methods that you see on your screen now are amongst some of the most common. So you have your standing desk on the far left, then you have a treadmill desk in the middle and you have your cycle ergometer desk on the right. Um, and there are sort of scaled up and scaled down versions of this as well. Um, so there was a whole sort of lot of research carried out on this and suggesting really that the simple standing desk is the best means by which to optimise um, the metabolic benefits whilst also allowing you to continue with your working day. But of course, then we had this very strange scenario where we were all sent home from work and we were suddenly working from our kitchens, quite literally. Um, and of course, there any method that we had of breaking up our sitting time previously was potentially removed. So another key question that you might have is I exercise daily. Am I OK? And this is where it's important to emphasize that there are two sides to the same coin. So one is no less important than the other. But the answer to this is possibly if you are an athlete. So the amount of exercise that is needed to offset the risk of prolonged uh, sitting throughout the day is 60 to 75 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity daily. 
So to put that into context, it's 420 minutes every week as compared with the recommended 150 minutes. And you'll remember that currently only 60% of people are achieving 150 minutes. So it's likely that this is possibly out of reach for a lot of us. Even if you're somebody who does train every day, I would encourage you to think critically about how much of that is genuinely spent in a moderate intensity, whereby you could have a conversation, but it would be broken and you'd be quite out of breath. And I think then um, this becomes more and more difficult to achieve. So it's important to highlight that they're two very different things with two very different risks and benefits. So if moving more is the medicine, then what is the dose? So first of all, we need to think about how much. And the literature suggests that about two minutes every 30 minutes is great. And that actually breaking this up more often is better than accumulating it all at once. If you have a standing desk, for example, then you should be aiming to accumulate two to four hours of use of this every day, but that this should be broken up and interspersed throughout the day as opposed to accumulated in long bouts. Again, with your two minutes, we're talking about a walking break. With your standing desk, then you're looking perhaps at um, 10 to 20 minutes every hour, for example. So what then does this look like as we talk about really living our whole lives from our living room. How can we move more when working and studying at home? So these are some examples and I'd be really interested to hear if you've had any um, sort of similar tips or tricks or if there's anything that you might add to this. Um, but I would encourage you to recreate your commute and make it active. So if, for example, you used to spend an hour in the car driving to or from work, then why not get out and go for a walk around the block for that time? Maybe not the full hour, but a 10 minute walk at the start and end of your day. Not only great physical benefits, but also a really nice punctuation to mark when you start and when you end your working day, because those lines, I think, are increasingly blurry for all of us at the moment. Can you stand at a raised surface for short periods? So I am working currently off a wooden cheese box on my kitchen counter and I'll tweet a picture of it afterwards um, to prove that I'm not making that up. And I'll do a couple of bits and pieces off this, um, you know, for half an hour here, half an hour there throughout the day. I find that really beneficial in terms of how my back and neck feel and also how energised I feel. So I don't have my standing desk, but I do have this. You could invest in an at-home standing desk. So some of them are available for less than 50 pound. I think I picked one up for about 35 pound plus delivery. Um, and that's also really, really handy. Um, can you incorporate walking into these online interactions that we now have? So if you've got a weekly department um, call or perhaps you're doing some group work with other students, can you take that Zoom call on the move? Plug your headphones in, um, you're able to take notes on your phone and just move around for a little bit more of, that, of the day instead of in sat staring at the screen. A lot of the research suggests that the best time to move more is following a meal or postprandial is the term that you'll see in the literature. So can you finish a meal and then go out for a 10 minute walk or do some of your standing uh, work straight after your meal? Can you walk for your mid morning or afternoon coffee? If you're anything like me, you've got a, I've got a, a, a pretty solid caffeine addiction. And instead of just walking to the kitchen counter, can you walk around the block before you um, have it? Or better yet, can you go down to the local coffee shop, support them and also get your steps in? And then finally, I would encourage you to challenge your friends, family and colleagues to perhaps a step count or a sitting time competition. Most of us have various ways of tracking this now on our phone, on our watches, etc. And sometimes a bit of friendly competition is the best way to get us sitting less and moving more. So that brings me to the end of this very much whistle stop tour through the evidence and through the literature. I hope that you found it useful and I would love to take any questions that you do have now. Thank you, Lizzie. That was really interesting. Um, I feel the need to go and run downstairs and come back up again. <laughs> yeah, I meant to say throughout. Anyone feel free to stand up at any point. <laughs> um, we've got well, we've got a couple of questions. The first question is just um, taking up from your point about uh, smart watches at the end. And, they, and this person says my smart watch rewards me for standing up for one minute in an hour. Do activity trackers like these actually not help as much as we think they do? What's your stance on that? 
Um, well, there's a number of ways in which you can look at this. I mean, if the question is, are they helpful in nudging us towards sitting less and moving more, then this person's comment in suggests that they are effective because um, they give us that reminder. It's also, however, very easy to just knock that reminder off. <laughs> um, I think we're all guilty of that. Um, and also it it can become difficult for people. Some people can feel quite overwhelmed by it as well if it's constantly beeping at us, telling us to, to move around more. So I think they can have a really useful um, role, um, but it does depend whether you're, you're taking it on board or not really. OK. That's interesting. Um, there was a question earlier about um, the impact of the pandemic on everyone in terms of how much we've all been sitting down. So can you give some of the examples about how it has um, affected the, the, the levels of, of set time sitting down and the movement you mentioned has actually had a, um, a converse effect? Mm, yeah, it's really interesting. So um, that that um, data from Sport England was only published um, a couple of months ago and I think probably to a lot of people's surprise physical activity levels had gone down and I think anecdotally I would have expected they'd gone up because um, I, I'm, huh? I would have thought that as well yeah I, I was really surprised um, because I think you know you went out for your we were allowed an hour's exercise a day weren't we so you went out for your hours exercise and you know you were just inundated with other people doing the same thing out for lots of walks, runs, bikes, etc. Um, but I guess the other side of that is a lot of opportunities to be active were closed. Um, so a lot of our green spaces were closed, a lot of gym, well of course all gyms, swimming pools entirely shut down and for some people they are their sole means of being physically active. And we also of course saw the closure of schools, um, the closure of sports facilities, of teams, so actually that just wipes out masses of opportunity. At least we know about that, so we know the impact that it's had on physical activity levels. What we don't know about is the impact that it's had on our sitting time. Um, it's a little bit trickier to measure. We know that people aren't very good at reporting it accurately. Um, and we also don't have a baseline. So Sport England have been collecting this data for a number of years um, on in terms of physical activity, how much exercise people do. But there's no population wide data on sitting time. So it's actually something that we will never really accurately know um, the true impact that, that the pandemic's had on our sitting time. Yeah, someone's picked up on that really. That there's, a, there's a comment there. Um, fantastic talk. I would be interested to hear your thoughts on people's decrease of movement during the pandemic. So you're saying that at the moment we're not really sure what people are doing if they're not getting that physical activity in. Mm, yeah, exactly that. So um, and I guess this highlights as well the need to look at these as two very different things. So, um, you know, physical activity and exercise are one side of it. And we know that people were doing less than that, according to Sport England data. But we don't then know if they were sitting more. The power of deduction would tell us that that is likely what they were doing. Um, we don't often tend to stand up at home um, for um, periods of time if, if we can help it. So, um, yeah, we would guess that people were sitting more, but it's it's not something that we will ever really know. The, the best we can hope for is that there might have been some research going on um, and I'm I'm confident that this will have been the case. You know, some researchers were already carrying out research on, say, 200 office workers. They were all then sent home and they can probably then measure the difference in those particular office workers. And then we the best we can do is sort of, um, you know, make some estimations as to what that means population wide. Yeah, I suppose it's quite early to tell. I guess one thing I was thinking of is office workers is only one small part of the population. Obviously, if a lot of people are furloughed, they might be doing more gardening, DIY, looking after children as well. So, Yeah, exactly. The Sport England data does take that incidental physical activity into account as well. Um, mm. But yeah, no, it's a really good point. And then, of course, we had the other um, the other occupations who were potentially more active. So, for example, your um, shop workers, your, your warehouse workers, your delivery drivers, you know, it's they're all very different demands, aren't they? So it may have had different impacts in that regard. Brill, um, there's another question that's just come in um, from Kay, who says, are there any small movements that you can do when sitting to ease the impact on vascular strain and muscle use? 
Yep, so um, there is some evidence that fidgeting can have a positive impact on vascular um, health. So if you are somebody who naturally shakes their legs when they're sat down, then that has been shown to be beneficial. Um, you can get some devices that go under the desk that you just sort of pedal your legs. So, you know, you're not cycling by any stretch, but you're keeping the skeletal muscle contracting and that therefore encourages um, blood flow through the tissue and that's beneficial. The best thing you can do though is, is move. So if you can stand up even for a minute and sit back down. Um, so it is thinking about how you can build that in. You know, can you take a phone call standing up? Um, you know, if every time the kettle's boiling, you walk up and down the stairs once those types of things, but fidgeting's good, standing's better, walking's best, I think is, uh, is a good way of looking at it. Brilliant. I think after this, we're all gonna go and change our habits, hopefully for a little while. <laughs> I don't think we've got any more questions actually. Um, so we'll wrap things up if that's okay. Um, Excellent. So um, yeah, it just leaves me to say thank you very much um, for, for doing the talk, Lizzie. That was really interesting. Um, we will make this lecture available on our website so people can watch it at a later date. Um, and don't forget, we've got lots more kitchen sessions um, happening over the next couple of months. So do take a look on our website and book some more if anything um, takes your interest. OK, so thank you very much, everybody, and we'll say goodbye. Thanks, Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.